Welcome back to the garage guys. In this video, we're gonna try back feeding the electrical panel in the house using these twin 3.5 kilowatt mango power portable power stations. You might remember one of these from the uh, El Camino video where we had it out uh, when we were out west using it on that trip. These are pretty convenient. They have a collapsible handle. So they sent me another one and all of the appropriate wiring to connect them together and do split phase 240. I'll be very curious to see how well these do powering the entire house and garage. I'll start by showing you my current generator setup too. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna answer a couple of the questions and concerns on the uh, diesel heater that the last video we did on this, uh, and also measure the carbon monoxide coming out of it. I got a little meter on the way to be able to check that. Got the garage warming up a little bit with the doctor heater right now. And so here is the electrical setup in the garage currently. Uh, the way I normally would power the house if uh, we get an outage is I come out and either fire up the Onan 10kW diesel generator or the MEP 803A military generator also 10kW. Haven't started this in a while so might as well fire this one up too. Preheat it for a little bit since it's really cold. Prime and start. There she goes. Nice and reliable. And then you simply close the AC circuit interrupter and you've got power being sent to the house. However, I think this is the one that's currently plugged in, so we'll go ahead and fire this guy up. There she goes. Turn this breaker on. And so that generator is sending power through this 8-4 cable into the main panel in the house where it's not powering anything right now, but also down to this guy. Uh, so the house power comes in right down here, and that's what's powering the garage right now. But if I want to power the garage on generator right now, I simply lift up and boom. That was just coincidentally, coincidentally the uh, blow-off valve going on. But now we're on generator power, and the reason I have it set up that way is because if I want to load test these, you know, I can turn this eight kilowatt on now, and that's putting a good amount of load on that diesel generator to prevent fouling over time. Uh, you know, what do they call that? Wet stacking of the rings and such. So that only powers the garage. If I want to power the house, I leave it on the normal setting, which I guess that blow off valve goes off every time you turn the power back on. And then you come down to the basement to the main panel where you will find the generator instructions and everything's color labeled and such. I made this custom interlock plate. So you have to shut the main off. And then you slide this up so you can't turn the main on and turn the generator on. So now the house is being powered by the diesel generator and the garage as well. And now I can shut these back down. Yes, color rattling on there. So now you guys see how the current setup works. Let's try hooking these mango powers up. I charged them both two weeks ago and then I used this one since. So let's see if the bottom one held a charge. Uh, of course, it, the, the setup I have is fully manual. You know, some people would like automatic transfer switches, but uh, you know, we don't we don't have that right now. Fifty six percent. This one's down to, and it held at ninety nine percent. We're gonna need to hook the communication cable up, and then plug this splitter in. Which, of course, these are accessories you have to buy if you want to do this. On this distribution block, you get twin two forty volt thirty amp outlets. It's a twist lock style, and then two of these. 120 volt RV style 30 amp outlets. I've got the E-Link cable on, both of them plugged in. I have this wire on here just because that wanted to kind of pull off a little bit since this isn't sitting on the ground. And now let's hit AC load, which that turned the bottom one on too. And now I should be able to run into the basement and power the house, but I guess we'll just go with the garage since uh, I don't want to disturb Jen again. She's watching TV. So off and there it is all right the garage is now being powered by the mango powers you see on this leg we're 243 watts and on the lower one showing 126 watts so at this point the obvious benefit over an ice generator is that we have zero noise or emissions coming off uh, we could plug solar panels into these right now and they would be charging as power is being pulled out uh, combined wattage of 6,000 watts potential right here. Maybe we ought to put that to the test and fire up the doctor heater. Let's put it on low to start with. I forget if that was six or 8,000, but I'm, I think it was actually 6,000 watts. And on low, we're pulling 1638 and 1514. Let's fire it up to high. And we've got 2926 plus 2838 watts. So yeah, that's a 6,000 watt heater. It would make sense. You can see these things don't seem to be struggling at all either. So uh, I mean, I could pull out the welder or plasma torch at this point and show you 
but I, I don't need to. You guys see almost 6,000 watts being pulled through both of these units. I'm gonna turn this off now. I can hear the cooling fans on both of them just turned on. And this is probably not the smartest idea, but I'm gonna try firing up this compressor. It's a two piston, uh, single stage. Uh, you have big surge out of these and it could potentially blow up a capacitor if you don't have enough uh, amperage there. But here we go. Nothing, it just, it just clicked it right off. It didn't even attempt. And it says PCS output fault. Let's see if we can easily reset these. Again, that was, that was a really big demand. Even though the MEP 803A can, can barely start up that compressor. I've, I've done it before, but it's, it's a big struggle. I'm, I actually did blow a capacitor up once on it. And so I held the button until that went away. And now we'll see if this just powers right back up. Yep. And we are back in business. So that circuit protection does work good. Turn this back on. At this point, I'm gonna just go ahead and send power to the house and we'll run the house on that for a while. Go ahead and throw myself a sausage in the microwave, see if that works good. These are usually around 1800. Yep, all right, cool. Made a slightly different noise in the beginning. Put this in for about minute 10. And well, heck, I think I might even brew some coffee. While that's brewing, I'm gonna fire up the toaster. And would you listen to that? Silence. No generator. Now, as far as load on here, you see the bottom one's pulling 2,950 watts and the upper only 114. So you got to be conscious about that, uh, you know, distributing the load across these because, of course, my entire kitchen is only on one hot leg. I mean, it's actually better this way since that one has higher percentage anyway, but something you'd have to, you know, keep an eye on. You want to distribute those evenly. But yeah, I think I'll leave those power in the house for now until they run down completely, make sure no other problems arise. It's definitely kind of neat being able to use the sun power in conjunction with those batteries to be able to power 6,000 watts in your house. Pretty awesome. Oh, would you look at that? Several hours later, guys, and I just came in to check them. The bottom one was down to 1% and it, it just dropped, dropped out. So we can go ahead and switch the main breaker back on. The initial test was a success and definitely evening out the loads, we would have had a lot more runtime, but it ran the whole house for about three hours and that was refrigerator, dehumidifier, you know, microwave, all that stuff going. And with this setup, you would have a whisper quiet 6,000 watts on demand at any time. You have your solar panels hooked up so they're charging all day. And if that's not enough, if it's a cloudy day or you wanna boost them, you fire up the generator, plug these in and they can each take 3,000 watts input charging so they charge up very quickly. Of course, you can't do that with the 20 amp cable. You do need the upgrade. 30 amp cable. Now, is this going to be the ideal setup for everyone? Uh, probably not. These are very expensive units, but for some people, this might work out. So I'll drop a link to them down below if you want to check out the pricing and such. I plan to do a bunch more testing with these over time. So I'll let you know in the description and comments in the future how they hold up. And if I have any problems, maybe even do an update video. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them down below and I'll you know, try to answer those. I'm going to be charging these over the next couple days with the solar panels. And I'm not going to lie with my so solar panel setup right now. It's probably going to take a few days to get both of these charged back up 100%. But once I get them juiced back up, I mean, I can say that all that energy we used tonight came from the sun, the sky. If you've got a bunch of solar panels, these can actually take an input of 2,000 watts each. So you'll be pretty good. Uh, you see I got some chemical spray on the side of that. Now, if you want to see the full initial review video we did on this, I'll drop drop a link to that down in the description as well. And uh, overall, yeah, gonna have to give it a thumbs up. Pairing these together was successful, as you saw. And I suppose at this point in the video, we will switch over to the, the heater, answer those couple questions, and show you the carbon monoxide output. The first comment in that video to address is the location of my carbon monoxide alarm. Uh, and yes, you guys are right. This should be mounted lower. I was reading online. They say usually around four to five feet high. So for I'll... now, I went ahead and mounted her on the two by four, which is pretty much central in this garage. Another comment was a guy saying he was very disappointed in the review since I was bragging about how the temperature is coming up in the garage, but I hadn't routed the exhaust outside like it's supposed to be. Well, as I said in that video, I was kind of comparing it to using one of these torpedo diesel heaters and you know, those don't route anything out and they do produce carbon monoxide. Plenty of people run them in garages and you know, they don't die from the fumes. Is it good for you? Probably not. But with the torpedo heaters, those always stink. This thing did not have a scent at all. So that's really what I wanted to know. I wanted to know, did this put out a scent burning a whole gallon of diesel and nothing. 
zero zilch so you guys saw what it could do at 100 percent efficiency and of course you route the exhaust out it might only be 80 percent efficient or so it's not going to heat it up quite as much uh, you could always use that hot stainless steel exhaust coming out and try to heat water or something else with it as a, as a great option too but it was never really a fair place to test the heater anyway because it's pretty large in here and i mean you can you can stick your fingers right outside there's there's gaps up top all right got the carbon monoxide detector i uh, just fired up the heater a few minutes ago so she's nice and toasty we're registering zero let's go ahead and start by putting this in front of the exhaust uh, i don't want to point the sensor right at the exhaust so i don't want to harm it or anything but put it right about here there we go registering 13. So i'll put on the side of the screen a a uh, chart what the safe levels are too but anyway it seems that carbon monoxide goes to the floor so i'm going to go ahead and set this right down there and then we'll come back in about an hour and uh, see what happens all right it's been one hour let's see we have zero on the carbon monoxide detector which i was just looking up a little bit it seems to be a common myth uh, i saw quite a few comments saying that carbon monoxide is heavier than air and that's just not the case it's actually around the same weight and they say it pretty much mixes in with the air in the room uh, so as you can see if this is accurate i mean it's let's put it back in front of here see what it registers kind of go a little bit for for their wicks it's pretty hot there yeah i mean i'm not getting anything off of here in front of the exhaust now I, I think that pretty much concludes that if you do run this in a swiss cheese garage like this it's probably not going to kill you uh but it's certainly the best idea to rent uh vent this outside because well, while it's running efficient right now it might not always run that way or if you have a, a misfire could smoke up the whole garage with diesel smoke and anyway run your exhaust outside but if it's running good it doesn't seem to be putting off very much carbon monoxide if this little meter is even accurate let's go try it on something else I just turned on my house heater let's drop it in here and see if we can register anything Put that in there for a minute Oh yeah, that's registering. And how about this car exhaust? I get oh, a couple feet away from it. Let's see what it does. Oh, the rising. Oh yeah. Yeah, so gasoline engines seem to put out a lot more. Let's put this right in front of it. See what it does. Yeah, that's going up just crazy. Holy smoke. So you can see that would that would kill you pretty quick. Just did a quick Google search and it turns out, yes, diesel exhaust produces way, way less carbon monoxide than gasoline. Uh, so that makes sense why the car was pegging the gauge. And uh, yeah, anyway, vent your heaters. Hopefully that answers the few questions and concerns and was a good demonstration of these powering the house. So, all right, I'll uh, close this one out now. Thanks for watching and see you guys soon.